Hello, everybody. This is Corsair Mack, president of the Illinois Mental Health Counselors Association. And today I'm joined by our very own special guest, Dr. Erica Wade Ball. How are you doing today? I am doing well. Right, perfect. I'm happy to hear that. All right. So for those of you that don't know, Erica and I, we have just a little bit of history together. All right. So actually, she worked at my school's counseling consultation center when I went to grad school there. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting to be able to interview her. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. That's, <laughs> that's, that was one of the greatest things in regards to having, you know, uh, a reach out from you is just thinking about my time at Northern and being like, right, I remember that, you know, you miss those interactions and those um, opportunities to connect with students, especially when you have this dual role or identity on a campus, you could be a, a student, and then you can also be, you know, working full time, you know, in the role, which I was at the time um, in the counseling center. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, mm -hmm. so we're going to go ahead and jump right into it because, Erica, all your fans want to know, how did you become interested in counseling? You know, I it's interesting about how often that is a question, but yet may not always happen as frequently because of just maybe it could be interactions or situations because some people may not think about that. They're maybe thinking about like, I need to figure out what I should do. So that's usually kind of how the conversation comes up. But um, for me, if that question will come to me, I always go back to the idea that counseling was in my mind as something I wanted to do, even though I did have a moment <laughs> that I wanted to be an interior decorator. Um, and then for a second, I wanted to be um, computer programming. So one interior, I couldn't draw. So I was like, yep, that's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Um, and then the computer programming, I couldn't get through math. And so <laughs> then I just continued on and focused on uh, psychology. And it grew from there because when I was even thinking about it, when I was in high school, I talked to my guidance counselor and I was like, I want to do what you do. And so that's really how it grew. And I've always been a, a person who was listening to my friends and always giving advice. And just naturally, that was my interest. Uh, and so then it just kind of came on. I actually did the psychology um, with getting my associates. So I always give a plug to College to Page. So I always encourage people, you don't have to go straight to a four-year university. So I didn't. And I appreciated that opportunity. And then I went on and got my bachelor's at Aurora University and then went and got my master's in clinical psychology. So I did psychology throughout my um, time. And so that's when I was able to start working in the field of counseling. All right, perfect. So I know you talked about going to a community college at first. So then this perfectly segues into our next question. I swear <laughs> we didn't plan this. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what schools did you go to for your undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate degrees? Yeah, yeah. So so kind of going back in 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 reality, why I chose College of Page. So to get my associates in arts at uh, College of Page, it was because it was in my neighborhood. So I just went there because it was close. And then when it was time to decide, interestingly, for my, um, to get my other two years to get my bachelor's of psychology, I first actually got admitted into Clark Atlanta University, was, did all orientation, did everything. And wild enough, because at the time I was a mother. And so my parents were like, yeah, you're too go, you can't go that far away. <laughs> and so they were like, you need to find someplace closer. And what happened was, is my dad is alumni of NIU. And so he, of course, said, you should go there. And so I, I did do that briefly. And so that's why I didn't say I graduated, because I did not. <laughs> but what happened was that the experience in Northern wasn't what I wanted or was for me. And so then what happened is I changed and went to Aurora University. So uh, Aurora became an interest because it was a smaller school. And I was used to College DuPage, who had smaller class sizes. And the professors at Aurora were just more connected, whereas like NIU was much larger. It was just a huge transition for me. 
And to me, that's where I felt more connected and grounded from my undergrad experience. And so from there, I then went to Benedictine. And interesting, they're all very close. So like, you got Aurora, which is in Aurora, you know, Illinois, and then you got Benedictine, which is in Lyle. So they're very all close in nature. But um, I decided um, Masters of Clinical Psychology at Benedictine because I originally was thinking of wanting to be a psychologist. And then I was like, five years is too long (laughs) at the time. And so I was like, oh, I could do this in two years. And so that's um, how I became at um, Benedictine. And then I took a long time off because I just was like, I need to work. And so it was probably, what would you think? Maybe about 13 years. I always can't remember the, the math, but from the time that, and there's a lot of work in between, I went from Benedictine, worked for some time, and then decided I want to go back and get my advanced or my post, you know, master's degree. So I got my doctorate in uh, philosophy and counselor education and supervision at Northern. So the wonderful nice thing is that my dad was alumni and then I was able to have that to be my alma mater as my um, doctoral programming. So it's interesting journey to even get where I'm at now. So, yeah. Okay, nice. Wait, when Mm -hmm. did you graduate with your doctorate? So I actually graduated in 2019. So it's really fairly recent. Um, and so thinking about that, it's, yeah, I, I feel like when you have time in the field and then you go back to get your doctorate, it's a whole different experience than maybe going, getting your master's and kind of going straight through, or some people get their bachelor's and then get their doctorate and then, you know, they go through and they're, they're pretty much finished, but I was able to, have some of that opportunity in the field to use that to get translated into my experiences when I was working on my doctorate. Mm-hmm. All right. Very nice. All right. So then yeah. with that being said, how long have you been doing therapy for? <laughs> right, man. When you get to a certain point, <laughs> <laughs> When you've been doing it over a decade, you start to say, wait, how long is you have to do, like get a calculator out and be like, what's the math? But um, I was able to kind of think back while I was sitting here and say, oh my gosh, it's been 19 years. So it's been a really long time that I have been doing therapy, which also even comes to a point where I really appreciate having that length of time because I've had so many different careers in between that time to really now be able to say, I can understand my niches or I can understand what I'm passionate about, or this is the stuff that I want to do or how I want to give back. And so um, to answer your question though, it, it has been 19 years. Okay. Very nice. All right. So then, you know, as you've been talking about it, right, you've been, you've had a whole bunch of experience, right? And knowledge, wisdom, <laughs> right, and right. all that fun stuff. Right, so right. Hopefully you can share some of that with us. So mm-hmm. what places did you start off working in your profession? And what did you learn as a result from working at those places? Oh, my goodness. I always love sharing this point of view because many people will go through three years or maybe, or maybe they'll do five years or maybe they'll do two years, but they will finish their degree and be like, okay, I am now going to be rewarded (laughs) with this great job and I'll have this licensure and everything will be wonderful. And then they graduate and it doesn't look like that. Uh, So one good thing to kind of even add in is, is, is my, kind of for my counselor ed hat is to really bring in the standpoint of the benefit of if you're interested in counseling, you go to a program that's KCREP accredited. And so KCREP is um, the accrediting body that oversees the counseling program. And when you go through that, you can actually go through your master's program and get your licensure before you graduate. And I wouldn't say you're actually handed it, it's just you do all the exams Mm -hmm. and you um, of course get supported and prepped, but that's part of the process so that once you're done, you can then submit your paperwork and then they can say, okay, yep, you now can be, you know, licensed because you pass exam and you submit everything, you've done your um, curriculum um, expectations. Whereas for me, 
I did not go through a KCRIP program. Like I mentioned, I went through clinical psychology. And so if you want to go way back, so back in the day <laughs> when I got my master's degree, it was a long time ago, but then it was also not KCRIP accredited. And so you had to finish your degree, get a confer, and then you actually apply to be able to get your license or sit wow. for the exam for your L LPC, which is wow. your NCE exam. Yes, right? You even said, wow, it's exactly wow. <laughs> so, so imagine that you have a degree, like for me, I had my master's of clinical psychology, master of science in clinical psychology. And you're like, I did all this work, but I have no license right now. So where can I work? <laughs> well, the time, nowhere. Um, <laughs> If people were asking for a license or they were asking for a little bit more experience. Like I did do like a year experience, but again, they want you to have more opportunities of growth to be able to say, okay, you can do this job. And so at the time I, it was really hard to find a place to work. And interestingly, I decided I'll work at UPS then. <laughs> <laughs> so I did UPS, which was so interesting. I did not probably about six months. Oh my goodness. Yes. I unloaded and loaded up boxes in a UPS truck before I was able to get my job. So I always try to say, yep, mm -hmm. you have to sometimes do some things that you may not expect to do to pay the bills, but then also to kind of give you motivation that it's going to happen. Um, and so I did that. And while I was there, eventually I got connected because of somebody who knew me. They said, there's this job at the DeKalb County Health Department. Would you want to be considered in taking this position, which is the HI prevention specialist? And they're looking for a case manager. And I was like, sure, I don't know <laughs> what that means, but why not? I can do it. And I did. I applied for it. And lo and behold, they didn't say I was overqualified. They were like, this is perfect. This is a great opportunity. And I, after being at UPS, started working there. I believe it was like either October of 2000. Oh my gosh, was it 2004? Yep, 2004. And what I always will say too is that I appreciate that moment. And for me to say, sure because it taught me the most, oh my gosh, the most incredible amount of information about how to connect to people, how to support individuals. It's it's not so much counseling, but it is, but you're learning that case management component, but you're, you're really having to connect people. I, I got to meet so many great individuals. I got to do a lot of outreach. I could do, I created a group, you know, like a support group. Uh, would go to do home visits. And to me, that really helped me understand about, you know, the mental health field, but also how to connect and to collaborate with other organizations, also work with different um, community um, engagements or programs, learn about different grant writing. So I learned so much that it was, it was a great uh, stepping stone to kind of get me into the, the field. And so that um, to me was such a great way to say, okay, you sometimes may not realize what's out there for you, but you should just try. And I'm glad that I did. All right, perfect. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So just like what you mentioned, you've had a very long road in regards to jobs. Right, because yes. you yes. from UPS to now case manager to then <laughs> working at the CCS, but then you know all of that led you to Adler University. Oh my gosh! Right, yes. I mean, oh, it. You know, when you say it like that, it makes me <laughs> makes me think about that. Seems so seamless, but it man, there was just so much you know, in there, which really kind of gets me into, it's like, I don't want to give my, my whole CV, but, but I will say, and this is what even came to my mind when you, you, you talked about is that, um, when thinking about my, my career, um, experiences is that I was trained as a case manager. So thinking about that, I was also trained as a social worker, because I worked in the hospital, so doing crisis, and then I was trained to work at a substance use intensive outpatient, so 
did CADC work. And then I also was trained doing forensics. So I worked in the jail. And then because of just happenstance, I wanted to work at Northern. I then worked in Northern. And so then that's university counseling. So I'm getting a very, man, diverse experience in regards to uh, understanding what it means to be in the field. And with that, I also did private practice. And so um, thinking about all those pieces, I feel like it really brought me to this point because in all honesty, working at Northern gave me exposure to both APA accreditation and then when I got my doctorate, the KCREP accreditation. So really having both of those arenas gave me then the interest to even say, okay, what's next um, working within, because I was in student affairs for shoot, I think nine years. And so, so being at um, Northern for, gosh, 2011 to 2018, so seven years. And then I went on to Governor State, and so I was the director of the counseling center there. And then once I got my doctorate, I was like, I think I want to try academia and try to work as, you know, be an assistant professor. And so then I really, you know, was passionate about training because of my time at being at, um, northern but then also doing private practice and then also working in the jail um and even like i said working even in the hospital and everywhere else it gave me that opportunity to work in doing training that <clears throat> that really set the stage for me to now transition and work at adler all right definitely yeah yeah so, so the... not linear <laughs> <laughs> not linear exactly not, not linear, linear at all <laughs> yes all right. So what would you say then is your favorite class to teach? Oh, man. Um, I I will always go into the realm of really helping students to understand, you know, the counseling practice or understand the profession. Um, so so definitely a lot of classes that are, you know, your first year experience. So so really understand the functions of being, you know, a counselor or uh, getting into uh, the skills So doing like counseling skills. Um, I also love doing group counseling. The other piece is, you know, assessment, even getting into treatment planning. And then uh, I do like research. I haven't done it so much with uh, master's level, but I have done it for for doctoral students. Um, and then because of my role as being director of training, it really became more of an emphasis, emphasis working on seminars. So teaching students that are currently at their um, clinical practice. And so kind of overseeing all of that. So providing support and advocacy or advisement to you know the students in regards to like, how do you find a site? Or what does it mean to decide this particular type of population to work with? Or how do I even, you know, start start a session? Or what are the questions you need to ask? What is my theory? So, so all of the stuff in regards to helping with that counseling self-efficacy um, is what I'm always interested in and excited about. All right, definitely. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we all could see you have been extremely busy. <laughs> right, right, right. right. So on top of this job, you also have your own practice as well, clinical expression. So what led you to start your own practice? Yeah, so <laughs> I will really put in the stands, and I'll even say this with even all of the jobs, except for maybe a few, it's been by happenstance. You know, somebody would say, hey, would you want to do this? I'm like, why not? And so, of course, I did. So. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of times I was juggling multiple things at the same time, which may seem like a lot, but with, with good time management and organization, you, you can make it work. And so with that, it came a point to where is once I was doing substance use, it was like, I, I think I think maybe it's it's beneficial to start my own practice. And so in 2008, I did. I, I launched Clinical Expressions. Um, I was like, let's see how this goes. And, and I did. And interestingly, that's how things kind of exploded into, you know, even, even where it is even now, just providing many different opportunities, either through like, um, EAP connections, or 
I worked with individuals or families that had children that were developmentally delayed. So then I would do home visits for that um, population. I would also do support with HIV prevention um, clients. So giving more of that counseling support for them. And then I st still did work with the jail. So I did offer like group counseling, individual counseling, um, and just did a variety of different things again, which was kind of similar to what I was already interested in. So, yeah. All right, perfect. So I always ask this of people whenever they have their own private practice, because I'm always interested in how did you pick that name? So what led you to choose the name Clinical Expressions? Oh man, you know, it, it, it's the hardest thing to come up with a business name, like, Right. And you gotta you gotta put this down on paper. You you can't just be like, hey, never mind. I was just kidding. Let me start over. Like you, I mean you can, but I, I really was, you know, struggling when I first was trying to fill out paperwork of like what do you call it? What should it be? Because this is like who I am. And when I put it on paper, I first was, of course, thinking, you know, clinical because of like counseling, but I didn't want to say counseling because I felt like that would kind of limit it in regards to, again, saying I'm just going to do counseling when I knew I was going to do maybe some other stuff. And from there, I was like, okay, what else do you do? <laughs> Can't just say clinical. Um, but when I thought of expression, I really thought of express before expression. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to do like an, 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 an evening of expression. That was going to be one of my galas that I was going to, going to do and even expression, just allowing people to do a lot of different um, expressive art or creativity poet. Because when I was working at Northern and doing outreach coordination, I did a, uh, depression screening event and one of the activities that we had I had people do an expressive type um, you know event and so that's always been in my mind and so hence you know counseling is about expressing yourself and so is about the counselor giving expressive feedback um, hence why it became clinical expression so that's really where the name comes from just really giving people that safe space and feeling like you express yourself how you want to if it's through writing if it's through body language if it's through listening to music so i love pe giving people opportunities to to share their music or maybe they want to draw or paint. It's just all that creativity um, in a safe environment. And so um, I, I appreciate and value authenticity. So, yeah. All right, perfect. Mm -hmm. So then at Clinical Expressions, are there any special projects that you're working on that you would like people to know about, whether it's in your private practice or outside your private practice? Yeah, you know, so <laughs> this is where it gets you know, interesting. Uh, when I had mentioned a, a, a few, you know, minutes ago, I got into the, you know, the conversation was just kind of saying that once it became now, which is, I would even say probably right be during pandemic or, you know, um, a little bit after pandemic, I shouldn't say after, because we're kind of like an after now, but I'll say like a year after being in the pandemic. So around like 2021, I started thinking about ways to be an advocate or what other opportunities I can do to enhance my skill set or my niche or what is it that I'm doing or want to do or continue doing. And I started thinking about coaching um, and, and looking into life coaching, but I was still unclear about what's really the difference between that. And I think there's a lot of individuals that will put it under the sense of counseling and it's like, it's not. And then some people will say, well, I can just be a coach because I can give good feedback. Well, it's not just that easy. And then there's this notion of what does it mean when you have a licensed, when you're a licensed individual, what does that mean when you're doing coaching? And so because there's so much gray and it was really unclear, I was like, I need to get more knowledge. I need to get some uh, training. And so I did take a uh, certification class to understand what does it mean to be a licensed professional as a coach, a life coach. And so um, with that, 
I wanted to expand my practice. But while I took that, there was an understanding that you can't have them both. You don't want to put your coaching and your counseling under the same umbrella just because they are they are different. And so hence, I had to create another business name. And so um, I wouldn't say it's under the umbrella, but it's part of who I am is that, you know, clinical expression is really about the counseling um, can be also education and, you know, consultation, but under coaching, which is life work. So my other business is life works, training and consultation. And so that really gets into the education training. So doing supervision. So it's the other part of what I really love to do, even though I also do it on a clinical expressions, but they're under different hats. And so I opened up LifeWorks and then I also uh, started holistic aromatherapy. So I'm going to do the umbrella of counseling is holistic aromatherapy. And so that's the other business that I have, which is doing um, essential oil. So body care and essential oil products to add to what I provide in regards to um, counseling, because a lot of people will be given feedback about taking psychotropic medication, which I am fine if that's what what you're wanting to do. But sometimes people want to go from a more um, natural route or they want to do more Eastern medicine. They want to kind of think of an alternative method. And so then I did actually expand on and get my knowledge in regards to being certified, you know, as an integrative mental health professional. So then I have knowledge in regards to like herbal supplement recommendations, what type of essential oils help with what. Um, so anything in regards to like how to minimize anxiety or stress or depression, what are the different types of um, essential oils that can help with that. And so I always try to give those additional resources so that we can help individuals to improve on their own needs. Because my thing is, I always try to say, I want to eventually be fired as a counselor because my my expectation is, is aiding people with the resources so they can start doing it on their own. The, the goal is to not have counseling be what you need to have for the rest of your life. You can, but I also want to encourage and empower individuals to um, have that. So, so when you say, <laughs> what is clinical expression? I'm like, well, and it's, it's an expansion. It's, it's grown in different realms, but this is, this is me from a holistic standpoint. It's, it's really looking at how you impact it from your mind, your body, you know, your soul, your emotions. Let's look at them all together because in reality, the mind really can impact the body and same thing as the emotions. And then and if you meet with a counselor and only talk about your emotions or only talk about, you know, what's happening with maybe what's going on at work, but yet you're sitting here and your back is hurting, you're not focusing on what I'm saying. You're focusing on, oh my gosh, my back is hurting. I can't really sit in here. I'm not comfortable. That impacts things. But if we know about that, or if I know about that, then that's a way to kind of find ways that we could really help support individuals um, from a holistic. So that's where I really have been trying to hone in and to kind of support, especially even from a personal standpoint. So um, that's a portion. <laughs> <laughs> That's a portion of it. So, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So now I'm hearing you don't just have your job in your private practice, but now you got like three different businesses going on. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Which is great. And it's so funny because it's not even on the camera, which I have to like move the camera somewhere because I have to bring it over. Like these are, mm -hmm. which is nice is the visualized, which is my one of my, my lotions that I have. And, and, and the interesting thing is I also was very intentional with a lot of the names that I put on like my essential oils, like really encouraging people to visualize. So you're going to be really thinking about something from the, you know, using anything from, you know, eucalyptus or, you know, peppermint to kind of help with you to be able to focus on different things. And um, I feel like I really wish I had a picture, but then there's like reflect, which is also get into kind of calming and helping you to get more of that lavender type experience. And so I was really excited about, you know, doing the lotions and the most popular oil is also meditate, which is really cool. Cause that also has um, lavender essential oils. But um, my, my thing is that 
it's nice to be able to give people a connection versus saying go to like Walmart or go to Bath and Body or go to someplace else because you don't really know what's put in there or actually know what is in there. And so it it may seem like yes, I have many things, but <laughs> they're all they're all connected. And so it, it makes sense um, about why we have different components versus having to have someone go someplace else where if I'm feeling like this person may need more coaching versus counseling, then I would say, hey, let's do coaching. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we, we start. And then if not, we say, hey, maybe it's counseling. And then it's, again, it's also in regards to, excuse me, essential oils. Um, but I think for me, it's always trying to find ways to, you know, get information out um, and, and give people the tools um, for, uh, what they need, which really brings to the other layers <laughs> is I was excited to start trying to communicate through writing, not just from a research standpoint, from like, you know, working at the university, but also again, through my practice. And so I wrote a book, which is the series of um well it's the self-care series and so which is nice i literally had it ready i was i was ready for this and so uh, this is the book that i have which is time management mm -hmm. um but again it comes back to like really talking to people and i can even get into more but it, it's really giving people the tools because you know a lot of people would always talk about how they never have time to fit in self-care and i'm like well of course you don't, because there's no alarm that lets you know that you need to do self-care. Like your car will tell you when it's running out of gas, because you'll start seeing you need to fill it up. And then say, for instance, your bank account will tell you, you no money in it. <laughs> it will give you a negative, you know, number or it'll say you only have ten dollars. Whereas self-care, your body won't say like, OK, you don't have enough happiness right now. Mm -hmm. You need time to fill up. Well, there's cues in other ways. Maybe you, you're not sleeping well, or you're getting irritable, or maybe you're not happy and smiling, you're, you're getting irritable and, and frustrated. So there are signs in a different way, but the important piece is like trying to find ways to kind of add in more of that self-care. And the, the, the goal is, is again, I wanna give people tangible tools. And so I you know put together the workbook so people can do that. And I can, they can do that while working with me so that they will be able to have something to kind of fall back on in between our time of, of meeting, uh, which then again, I feel like there's always, and then there's more, there is more. I feel like I'm on, I'm like Oprah and you can have a car and you can, but <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but it is to that point about you want people to have choices. And the, the other um, project that I'm, I'm working on is, um, June 1st, launching the Year of You, which is Y-O-U is the acronym, but Year of You is really focusing on you. And so it's it's giving people on-the-go strategies to help them be able to improve any of their um, life challenges and just be able to have those resources. And so that's something that I'm encouraging people to also to, you know, subscribe and be part of that newsletter so they can get those resources to also have something that's tangible. Um, and so, as you can see, it goes into this wonderful moment of like, there's so many elements that I like to give. Um, but, but I will say it's all because of the many different experiences that I had down the road that it's nice to now say, okay, I've been doing this for over a decade. Now it's time to say, okay, we need to give back. We also need to um, put in perspective that you have a lens that you can utilize to be able to say, okay, this is what I'm thinking would make sense based off of my experiences. All right, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, within all that stuff, now I know you're an author now, keep on finding out more new and new things about you. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. Well, well, and this is where I have to also get into, because I'm, I'm excited that even doing this is getting to like social media. So to, mm -hmm. to even say like, you know, knowing more about is, you know, encouraging people to, you know, follow me on Instagram so they can find me at, you know, at Dr. Erica and you. And so people can look like, wow, link and click link the um, bio to be able to um, have all the information, like where to get the book, where they can find out about essential oils, how they can subscribe to 
the, the newsletter. It's finding people to be able to know where to get the information so they know what I'm doing because um, I am I'm all about innovation. I, I love creating. I love putting things out there. I like people to not necessarily feel like they, they don't have a person who wants to listen or have someone who's available because there's, there's so many individuals that are seeking for someone to just say, hey, I see you or I get you or I understand. And so that's, that's what I'm really all about because I always say that I'm where I am because someone stepped up and said, hey, you know, I, I understand, or let me help you, or let me give you that support. Um, and that was really beneficial for my successes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the final three questions, one other question I want to ask you is, you know, what led you to be a life coach? Because normally you see those two hand in hand. And sometimes people are like, no, if you're a counselor, you really shouldn't do life coaching and things like that. So what was your yeah. process? Yeah. Um, it's really about, again, knowing who you are, uh, knowing, um, what does it mean to be a counselor? What does it mean in regards to, um, understanding how clients are going to change or need to change? And in all reality, you know, I've always said I'm in, I'm very integrative, which used to be not a great way to say things, especially when you were first time coming out. You shouldn't really be integrated because that means you're not really sure what you want or <laughs> what theory it is. But <clears throat> the reason why I've always kind of appreciated it is because integrative speaks to, again, my lens and how I encourage people to embrace change or appreciate change is that I'm going to meet you where you are. And I, I've been very much from my master's program trained, you know, person centered. They said Rogerian back then, it's client centered or it's person centered. It's changed so many different ways. But Carl Rogers, so <clears throat> really that empathic, you know, unconditional positive regard is is really giving that space for someone to feel authentic. Um, but but to me, I was like, okay, I want to expand that even more just to get into understand that everybody's different when they come to the room. And so sometimes what the theories that were in the books is not what we use with everybody. Like you can't assume that everybody's cookie cutter. You have to be able to um, have an awareness about who your client is. And it's important to have that flexibility and to, to be an out-of-box thinker. And I, I really come to the stance that sometimes it may be more of that mentoring. Uh, sometimes it may be where you're, you're, you are trying to give some solutions or some opportunity to hear some guidance, or it's really just giving a place for them to just share their story. Um, but when it comes to life coach, I really was able to understand that, yes, life coach has a lot of foundations from a theoretical standpoint that is from counseling. But it also comes from a, you know, developmental standpoint. So there's different other theories that are looked at in regards to um, a person's understanding in regards to how they change from a, a developmental standpoint. Um, there's their pieces about, you know, understanding that, that goal setting or really creating uh, direction. It's very much in the now. It's not really focusing so much on somebody's past but what I was able to gain just from my my experience and my learning is that I, I really do have a coaching style um, which was kind of really nice to to understand because I think some people feel like you should be a certain way from a, a clinical practice but I really connected more with that um, coaching energy but again it also gives more of that flexibility you don't have to be so much focused on oh this is where we need to stay and you can't think about anything else well when it comes to uh individuals from many different backgrounds you can't be so focused because sometimes it will be so inaccurate um if you start assuming what some of the theories say and to me you could be very discriminatory you could create some oppression um and you could also cause harm and so it's really important to make sure that you are really aware, even from a multicultural standpoint, which which I will say, coaching is not there yet. I think that's what's missing. 
that we do need to be even more involved in understanding even from a cultural standpoint, like occlusion, how are we also being aware of how we are connecting with individuals? So I feel like there's advancements, there's changes, but there's still a lot of work that we need to understand. And so we need to start increasing our knowledge. But still, to me, I feel like I also wanted to create a space for individuals who are saying, I don't necessarily need you know, to work through my mental health, but I do need to learn how to strategize or how to develop my leadership, my, my skills from a leadership standpoint, or I'm really trying to figure out what type of job I need to be getting, or uh, I'm trying to uh, make sense of what is the next step in regards to my goals long-term. And it may not just be professional, it may be in other areas. And so it's really good to have that space when that's not always a possibility when you're doing that in counseling. Mm -hmm. That is true. Mm -hmm. I will agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So with that being said, <laughs> we're down to our final three questions because, you know, oh all God. good things must come to an yes. end. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's like you just want to you just want to keep talking, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that is true. <laughs> all right. So first out of the final three, is there anything that you would like to tell people starting out in the field or have been in the field for a while? Oh, yeah. I think I, I really go back to sometimes we feel like we have to have all the answers or sometimes we feel like, man, this is, this is not someplace I can be because I don't, I don't have X, Y, and Z. Like we always do this comparison contrast or we always try to feel that um, I may not be, you know, smart enough or I may not be able to financially, you know, pay for something or there's always some type of ob obstacle that may keep people from wanting to pursue their dream or something that there is a goal. And I always say it's important to always ask and always try and always think outside the box that just because you, the first no seems like that makes sense doesn't mean that's where you're supposed to stop. You know, you, you should really always at least experience something because I, I really remember um, when I first got my job at Northern, my goodness, um, I, I, I was, I was like, wait, this is how much you're paying me? Like, you know, like what? Um, and, and it was laughable, but I will say that I knew long-term where that was going to take me. I knew I just need to get through this door. I need to get through this arena. This may be temporary, because in actuality, I know something's going to happen later. And, and I really appreciate me having this trust, even though I had no idea <laughs> what it was going to look like down the road. I still trusted that there is a, there's going to be a, there's going to be a plan. I, something's going to turn out. And lo and behold, it did. I gained a whole lot of experience and connections and skills at you know uh, northern working in in higher education and it it really allowed me to eventually again have an opportunity to get a degree and that to me was my reward at the end your patience allowed you to get rewarded <laughs> at at the end and it, it gave me also a, a voice to say that even though you may feel that you aren't capable best believe you are. You just need to have that person who's going to remind you or encourage you. And um, the interesting piece is that even like my dissertation, I go into the fact that, you know, I really looked at uh, imposter phenomenon, racial identity development, counselor self-advocacy. And I looked at that because imposter phenomenon is what I experienced when I went back and got my, my doctorate. And imposter phenomenon is so much out there mm -hmm. that it's just another reminder of that can sometimes be that obstacle or that could be that voice or that um, feeling that may keep people from wanting to do whatever. But the expectation is, is that not everybody who gets a doctorate is because they're smart. You know, it, a lot of times it's because of what they, who they know, <laughs> what resources they have access to that right. can, that can give them those, those, those tools, because there's many people who haven't had to pay for a degree because maybe they're a graduate assistant, 
you know, assistant, or maybe somebody knew somebody else who then was like, oh, yeah, your scores aren't that great. Well, here's what else we'll use to help you be able to, to get into the program. So the piece of it is that I, I encourage everybody to keep asking questions. I am a big person and big proponent of always asking questions. If, if you're a dear close friend of mine, you know that I ask questions all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's important because there's there's answers. So why not ask the question? And if you can't ask questions, then then you might need to figure out, okay, who can for you? <laughs> or or maybe you should write them down and maybe you can send them to somebody, but you should always ask questions because not everybody or everything is supposed to just fit a certain way because somebody might have designed it where that didn't make sense. Or it made sense at that time, but when you did it, it may need to look, be revised differently because we are now becoming a very diverse population that we can't always assume that everything is going to work or fit the same way um, it did maybe 10 years ago. And, and, and COVID really taught us that we can actually communicate virtually, just like we're meeting <laughs> now. Like, we can do this. Um, and so just realize that things are changing and it's opportunity for people to maybe say, even though that may not be something that you may think of, well, at least try it and see. And then you may be surprised um, that it actually may be the best thing for you. Because many times, the one thing that you're very scared of and not wanting to do is because that's what's meant for you to do. It's just you don't have that belief in realizing that it's in you, but you just need that one person to say, I know you can do this. I bet you can do this. So let's just have you try to do that. And a lot of times that is the place that they're supposed to be in. And so that's the one thing I always try to say, don't always look at it from face value um, or sometimes even from what somebody else says, just go off your instincts because a lot of times your instincts are spot on. So, yeah. All right, definitely. Yeah. All right, so second to last question. <laughs> Yes. So, is there anything that you would like to say that I haven't had a chance to ask you about? Oh man, I feel like I said so many, so many things, and I'm like trying to think about like what were some other pieces that I would even say. I think, I think the important thing is is that um, it's it's good to just kind of try many different opportunities, especially especially when I think about the fact that there's many things out there that I feel that many, many jobs are not really posted. It's like, for some reason, it's like that slug bug, you know, you see it the one time and then all of a sudden you see it like, you know, 50 million times and you're just like, wait a minute, I didn't even notice it this time. Well, sometimes you just got to get exposed to stuff and eventually it starts becoming like an algorithm <laughs> in the real world. And so it's it's really good to just kind of start exploring outside of your comfort zone. And so for me, I think um, it's really good to encourage, you know, individuals to just start, um, you know, maybe either doing like um, shadowing people or maybe just doing like a, uh, a class that may be virtual. So it could be like a workshop. Um, or maybe even sometimes it's saying, hey, let me just take one class at a time and, and see if that makes sense for me. And so um, for that, I think that is just another kind of added um, element in it. But um, I think maybe just to tie in and going back to the same element is that, you know, I'm trying um, from a different point of view because counselors are at high demand now and there's so many uh, there's only so many of us and there's so many people who need uh, many things and so um, I'm trying a different route by doing a lot of um, social media connections so trying to find different ways to connect and and talk to people and so like I said doing you know the year of you newsletter and so trying to encourage people to subscribe to that and and to follow me you know on Instagram or maybe you know follow me through uh, LinkedIn uh, and and just to me really encourage people to engage and to give comments or to share you know maybe feedback because the more we get information myself, the more 
we enhance and create opportunities for information to be shared. And so um, I think that's the biggest thing that I would just kind of keep, you know, putting out there is just follow, you know, on Instagram, but then also keep encouraging people to put themselves out there um, because everybody is um, open to experiencing new things and not everybody experiences is, 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 is not worth being listened to. Like everybody should be okay with being able to say like, Hey, this is what's going on with me. And so we'll just put it out there or try to reach somebody so they could talk to me, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. Definitely. I agree there. And that mm -hmm. perfectly segues into the final question. Right? I swear we didn't plan this, everybody. <laughs> Are we sure? Are we sure? <laughs> no, no, that does <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. But where can people find or contact you if they want to learn more information or if they want to connect? Oh, yeah, I think it's the same thing. I think it just goes back to, you know, follow me on Instagram, like I was mentioning, or LinkedIn. Um, yes, if people want to be a student, they can come to Adler, you know, and, mm -hmm. and be a student they're interested in um, and wanting to get their clinical mental health. But but in, in all reality, too, and I feel like I'm not really sure how much space or opportunity may be but if students or um, other clinicians or you know clients or individuals just have questions that they may have in regards to professional um, trajectory or maybe just curious about like you know is this the population or they need need supervision um, definitely encourage people to reach out and ask questions I'm definitely always in support of being able to give individuals um, any type of feedback or support. And so if they want to talk or consult, I'm always happy to do that because I remember when it was time for me to decide on what degree I was going to have or what I was going to pursue. And the, the feedback I got was look at the program or the, the course description and do a comparison contrast. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and yeah, I decided and, and went on the counseling route, but that not that's not always the 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 right way to you know <laughs> figure that out. Yeah. Um, because in all reality, many people I will say will acknowledge, like, so you're a psychologist, right? And I was like, no. Oh, so you're a social worker? No. You know, it's always interesting. I'm like, no, that's, I don't know why that's always the first thing that people say. I mean, I do know why, because those are more uh, readily talked about. But um, I think to me, all mental health fields um, are very similar. They just have different tenants than others. And so it's really important for people to just be um, open and realizing that you just got to start asking different questions and inquiring it because there could be a lot of overlap. It's just really trying to figure out what does it make sense for you in regards to your own professional um, interests. All right, perfect. Yeah. All right, so that being said, that is it for this interview. We definitely have to have you come back for a part two because there's a lot of stuff about you that I did not know about. <laughs> I know, I know. That's what people always say. Like, my students will say, how do you have time? I make time, you know, but I also um, do self-care and, and, I, and I love movies and I love, you know, having time riding my bike and working out and doing all this stuff. So, mm -hmm. so there's things about when you love what you do, you, you make time. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. All right, everybody, make sure you follow her on Instagram. Make sure you check out her book as well. Make sure you check out her essential oils and those lotions, right? Those are lotions. Yes. Too. Yes. Essential. It's so funny that I'm like, I don't know why I didn't have them in like the, the clear shot of the wonderful, you know, oils. Oh, and all this there you stuff. go. Yeah. Even bath bombs. So yeah, it's, it's all about, again, creating that uh, relaxation, rejuvenation opportunity. So yeah. All right. Perfect. All right, everybody. That's it for this interview. Again, thank you, Dr. Wade for coming and talk to me. I really do appreciate it. You are so welcome. Thank you. All right. No problem. All right. So this is Corsair Mack, president of the Illinois Mental Health Council Association, signing out, and I will see you all in the next interview. Take care.